Lord, to be with your father and to have a relationship with him forever. Is that good news, you guys? You know, one of the things that I get to do, and we're going to uh, show a short video, and it's going to have the doctor that was actually in the room when I died, when my heart stopped for an hour and 45 minutes. I tell people all the time, it is easy for me to prove that I died. I was considered clinically dead. That's what I was considered, clinically dead, all right? It's easy to prove that. The medical record said an hour and 45 minutes. The doctor, which you're going to see, Dr. Rigge, he wasn't the one that caused the issue. He was the one that was called in to try to clean up the mess. You're going to hear a little bit from him of what he thinks happened to me. And I like the way he says it. I'm going to just give you a, just a, he says I was really, really dead. <laughs> he didn't just say I was dead. He said I was really, really dead, okay? But because I was born again, because I am a redeemed, because I am that new creation in Christ Jesus, I went where redeem or Christians go. It is not unusual for Christians when they leave their body or what we call die to go to heaven. That's what happens to us. Is that good news? And it happens because Jesus said it. And I know there's some in the room that may say, that's your belief system. And all I could say, and I'm not saying it in pride. I'm not saying it to be arrogant. But I'm saying it because I want you to understand, you'll find out. <laughs> Everybody on the planet is going to leave their body sooner or later. Amen. Us that are connected to Jesus Christ are going where he says we go. I went there because he said it, not because I said it. You got to grab that. Go ahead and show that little clip, and then um, I'm just going to sit up here. I'll be smiling. <laughs> I did not think he was going to survive. I, and I, in a way, I, I told his wife that, you know, now well, we have just to pray and, and wait because there is nothing else I can do. I believe in healing. I believe that God is a healer. And uh, I was trusting God for Dean's healing. Three days later, Dean woke up. He was so eager. We got to get people saved. We got to let people know about Jesus. Despite doctors' concerns that Dean's prolonged ordeal would leave him impaired or even worse, there are no signs that Dean even had a brush with death. He's the picture of health. In fact, the staff at St. Francis Hospital dubbed him the Miracle Man. It's a miracle that he's alive. There's no question about it. It is a miracle. Yeah, he's alive, that he's talking, that he has no brain damage. Uh, but but this, this is very exceptional because he was really, really dead for, for a long time. I like that part. It was a script. It wasn't someone saying, Dr. Rigue, can you please put it in these words? That was his words. And coming from him, you guys, he is a person um, that in that hospital, in uh, St. Francis Hospital, where this took place uh, at, in Federway, Washington. I used to live in Washington. Now I live by the other Washington, uh, Virginia, OK? I always tell people me and my wife moved um, from Washington State to another country. <laughs> some of you get that, some of you don't, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the bottom line is, in Washington State, Dr. Rigge is, was rated as in the top 10 doctors in the state of Washington. And I always have to tell people there are more than 10 doctors in the state of Washington, okay? But the other thing, that he was rated as the number one patient care doctor in the state of Washington. So his credentials are what we say sound. I've had even people get a hold of him and ask him, was the man dead? You know what he said? The man was real, really dead, you know? I'll be honest with you. So he knows what dead is. He's a critical care doctor. His job is to come in there at the last moment to try to stop people from dying. So he knows what it is. So I always tell people, I can prove I died, you know? My heart stopped for an hour and 45 minutes. People said, why did he keep on working on you? He's, the only reason I believe that he really kept on working on me is because my wife and others were praying. Somebody better grab what I just said there. 
Everything said because the norm for him is 30 minutes and he quits. Now, I would have been okay if he quit after 30 minutes. You know why? Because I was with my father and Jesus. I was in a great place. Okay? You guys don't understand this, but I'll let you know this. This place got issues. <laughs> Lots of issues. I was in a place there was no issues. Everything was right. It wasn't just peaceful. It was past peace. There was nothing to be peaceful from. You guys grabbing this? You know? So I was in a bad place. But because of my wife, I called her as general. You can see why. You got to get a piece of that today. Okay? She directs a whole lot. She still directs me. <laughs> no one else is getting that but me and her. <laughs> But she still directs me. Phil, she still directs me, okay? I'm telling you that right now, okay? She directed even how people were going to pray for me when I was going through this. She put a sign outside the, the room where I was at after I had come back and I was on life support. I had a breathing machine brewing the breathing for me. My kidneys had stopped operating, so I was uh, put up to dialysis at the time. They were pumping a bunch of drugs in me. They did not expect for me to make it. That doctor later on says, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that I'm talking to you right now. Because his norm is 30 minutes, and that's it. But he went another 30 minutes, and another 30 minutes, and another 15 minutes. And I really believe he did it for one reason, because my wife and others were praying. You guys hear me? Was he a Christian? I can't tell you that. But it didn't matter in God's kingdom. God wanted something to happen, and he was moving it forward. Someone better grab what I just said there. You know? They even said when they did this interview, this is the 700 Club that did this interview. They said that when they uh, were interviewing him, he pulled out the EKG, and it showed the flat line. This was five years later that they did this. Five years after this happened. And when he pulled out the EKG and he looked at it, he started crying. It impacted him that much, okay? So to prove I, I, I died, that's the easy part. I even had a TV program I said the other the last morning, yesterday morning, called Inside Edition that did an investigation. They wanted to prove that these type of things don't really happen. And so they investigated us. They came back and told me they couldn't put me on TV because it was too true. <laughs> you guys get this. So I can prove I died. I can prove my heart stopped for an hour and 45 minutes. That's what the medical records say. I'm not saying that. That's what the medical records say. Now, the other issue of going to heaven, that's a whole different story. But because I was born again, because I knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, because I confessed with my mouth and believed in my heart, because I became a redeemed. When this body stopped operating, I went where Christians are supposed to go. It's not unusual for Christians to go to heaven, you guys. That's what happens to us. Not because I said it, because Jesus said it. One of the things I like to do is use the word of God when I'm telling this story. A lot of times people say, why do you use the word of God? Because I'm way short. I'll be honest with you. I'm trying to explain an eternal realm and a temporal place. And I'm using temporal things to talk about an eternal realm. You guys hear me? I use the word L-I-K-E a whole lot. I say it's like this. I'm not saying this is what it is. This is the closest I can come to describing what it's like. One of the reasons for that is there's something here that's not there, and it's called death and decay. Nothing there is dying. You guys hear me? Do you know what it would be like if everything on this planet did not, I mean on this planet rather, did not have to fight against death or decay? Even your own bodies? I was telling my wife this morning, in heaven there is no immune systems in your system. <laughs> Do you guys get that? You don't have to have something in your body trying to push off death and decay. And most of us on the planet don't even realize we've gotten used to the smell of it. It's in the air all the time. You're smelling it right now, whether you realize it or not. You ever gone to a place and it stinks for a while, then after a while, you get used to it. Yeah. I'm not saying this place stinks, okay? <laughs> now, old Dean came here and said, Plaxburg stinks. No, I'm not saying that, okay? <laughs> but I'm letting you know, we get used to the smell. Most of us don't like hospitals. 
And the reason we don't like hospitals, because we don't like the smell in it. You know what's going on in there? Death and decay. Most of us don't like uh, elderly homes or, or uh, places where we put people that are retired. You know why? Because we're smelling death and decay. All of us should not like an outhouse. You know what an outhouse is? You go in the outhouse, what do you smell? Death and decay. You know? My brother, he worked for NASA for a number of years. He was pretty high up in NASA. And he said, one of the things that astronauts would say when they get to the space station up there where, you know, everyone goes after a while, up there for a while, he said the first thing they notice is how stinky it is because no one's taking a bath up there. You guys getting this? He said, but after three weeks, they get used to the smell. You guys getting this? There is death and decay going on on this planet all the time, and we've gotten used to the smell of it. But in heaven, there is nothing decaying. There is nothing falling apart. You guys getting this? One of the things I get to do this morning, and I'm going to take a little break in a second here, but I want to read a scripture. One of the things I get to do this morning is I get to tell you what it's like to die as a Christian. I cannot tell you what it's like to die as a person that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I can only tell you what it's like to die as a person that does know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I use the scriptures to frame it. The reason I use the scriptures to frame it, because I'm not the one that put the requirements in or the uh, boundaries on how we are going to die, us that know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Is that good news? One of the things that is said in the Bible, and I love it, it's found in John, the 14th chapter, 1 through 6. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I love that part. That's why I went, because he said, that's what happens to us. Is that good news, you guys? He said it. I got to experience it. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's two things I want to point out. Number one is this. This is Jesus Christ yelling to the entire world, trust me. You're going to leave your body someday, but you that are connected to me are coming where I am. It's the good news, you know. There are people out there that do not believe you go to heaven when you die. They believe you go into the ground and you stay there for a while, and then when Jesus Christ comes, then you're going to raise up, and then you go to heaven. But because they're born again still, guess what? They go in the old way. Yes, they're wrong, but they're born again. That's the requirement. It's not that you believe you go to heaven. It's to believe that you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You guys getting this? I went to heaven because he said it. Is that good news? But this is Jesus crying out to the entire world, trust me. Someone says, well, he said he's the only way. I didn't come up with the rule. He did, and he didn't make it hard for us. He said, just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you shall be saved. How hard is that, you guys? How hard is that? It's not that hard, is it? I have people all the time say, but that's your belief system. And I say, you're going to find out. It's the way it is. It's past the belief system. It's the way it is. If I'm to drop off of this stage, it's gravity. I could have said all the way down, I don't believe it's going to happen. <laughs> Didn't matter if I believed it or not. It's still gravity. It's still there. And you know what the Bible says? Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Do you know it's coming out of their mouths any old way? It is better that it comes out of their mouth here, Linda, than it does there because there it is too late. You ready? High five. five. <laughs> Got to make sure. Right now, I'm going to stop. I'm going to let Pastor Mike comes up. He wanted to do this right now. 
in the sense of an offering, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to tell you what it's like to die as a Christian. And you can tell I'm smiling, so it ain't a bad thing. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor Mike. Praise God. So we'll be very brief because I know you're sitting on the edge of your seat, seats, right? Okay? <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Lord, thank you for this love offering. Thank you for your servants. Thank you for the sacrifice that they make. Lord, to leave the comforts of home, family, to travel around this nation and wherever the world in order to share this wonderful good news. And Lord, we're grateful for that. So Lord, with our gifts that we offer now, we're saying, Lord, this is how much we appreciate. Jesus' name, we thank you for it, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Okay. You're welcome to come back. Praise the Lord. <laughs> like I said, I get the opportunity to tell you what it's like to die as a person that knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I always put that in there because I want people to know. I can't tell you what it's like to die as a person that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And someone said, well, maybe it's not as bad as you think it is. I don't know how bad it is. I just know how good this was. <laughs> you getting this? So I can tell you how great it was for me at the moment. You got to understand, according to the medical records, 29 different things went wrong with this body. See, I had a simple kidney stone. I don't know why I always say simple. Ain't no kidney stone simple if you have it. You that are in the room, if you ever had a kidney stone, you know what I'm talking about. Ain't no simple about it. It hurts. You ain't dying, but you feel like you're dying. You guys know what I'm talking about? I had a simple kidney stone stuck on this right side over here, and I had a kidney infection. They gave me antibiotics to kill the, uh, uh, the infection, but it didn't do the job. But they never went back to check to make sure it was gone. So when they went to blast the stone, they pushed the poison into my body, and everything in my body started shutting down. I was poisoned. Everything started shutting down. It's what you call sepsis. Muhammad Ali that passed away not too long ago, that's what he died of. His body became sepsis, and he died of the poison that went through his body. That's what went wrong with this body. And according to the medical records, 29 different things went wrong. You know what my God had the nerve to do? Heal all 29 different things. <laughs> Many people, when they look at the records and they look at all the stuff that I put in, because I just, for the first five years, we couldn't get any doctors to come forward and um, say anything. Dr. Rigge wouldn't even come forward. The main reason is everybody thought I was going to sue the hospital. You guys hear what I just said? We were getting the medical records, and it was hard for us to get the medical records. They were doing everything they could to stop, stall from getting the medical records because they thought we were just getting the information so that we could sue them. I tell people all the time, you go to heaven and come back and see how many people you sue. <laughs> you don't have that mindset. Ain't nothing on this planet is worth it, you guys. I know we think it is because we want all this stuff, but this stuff passes away. That stuff doesn't. Somebody better grab what I just said. So here it is, you guys. I go into the hospital, they blast the stone, the poison goes through my body, 29 different things go wrong with my body. God heals all 29. I believe in healing. What do you think? Yeah. You know, I lost oxygen to my brain for over five minutes, usually five to eight minutes, and you end up with brain damage. I have no brain damage. I always hear this voice in my head says, that's according to your definition, of course. Then I hear my wife says, I thought he had brain damage when he first came back. <laughs> and her criteria for brain damage was this. Because she would put the garbage by the door and I would pass by it, she thought something was wrong with my brain. <laughs> I told her, in heaven there is no garbage. I got out of the habit real quick. <laughs> but I have no brain damage. I should not be able to form the words I'm forming right now and you hearing them, according to the medical records, my toes had died. Because after 17 minutes, without any oxygen or blood going through your body, things start falling apart. They start dying. And my toes had died. They were planning on bringing me back in the hospital, cutting off all 10 of my toes because they were dead. But you know what God had did? He healed all 10 of my toes. I have no residue. I'm not on dialysis. I'm not taking any medicine. See, Dr. Dr. Wallace, I got to tell you this. He healed everything. 
and I am, have no residue. Somebody better grab what I just said here. Some of you are just, oh, that would be good if he does this, but I'll live with this. No, you don't have to live with any of it. He wants you totally healed. He wants everything in your body functioning so that you can get out to do the things that you need to do for him. Because whether you realize it or not, some of you, the reason you got the medical issues is because the enemy knows if you're dealing with the medical issues, you can't be out there doing what God wants you to do. Somebody better grab what I just said. And it isn't just to get that little sticker so you can put it in your car so you can park up front. <laughs> Pastor Michael, you know what I really believe? I believe we should have an area for those little stickers. So everyone that gets healed, we put the little stickers up here. That's what I believe. You know, but God healed everything. And I really believe it's because of my wife and others. Like I said earlier, she put a sign outside the door that literally said this. This is after I came back and I was on all those machines, breathing machine, dialysis. And she put a sign outside that said no one enters this room without Mrs. Braxton's permission. And you know why, Phil? Because she wasn't letting anybody in there that did not believe I could be healed. It didn't matter if it was family members. It didn't matter if it was best friends. And I had a best friend that she told not even to come to the hospital. But look at the results. You guys getting this? Look at the results. Not only am I back in my body, but I'm totally healed of all 29 different things. And someone said, well, that's not a lot. Well, if you die, that's 100%. <laughs> you know? That's our Lord. But I'm going to tell you something. I was born again. I knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I became that new creation. So when I left my body, I went to where Father said we we're supposed to go. Do you guys hear me? I can remember when they were wheeling me down the hospital room, uh, down the hallway, rather, after this had happened. And I was having a hard time breathing, Sister Elizabeth. Really what happened is I suffocated. Everyone says your heart stopped. It only stopped because it wasn't getting no air. But I suffocated. I died the worst death that I could die for me. See, as a little boy, I remember jumping into a pool of water and almost drowning. So I knew what it was like to struggle for air. And I even said this to God. No one else knew this but me and God. If I'm going to die, don't let it be suffocation. And what was I doing? I was suffocating. And when the moment was coming on me, I knew I was dying. I knew it, you guys. It wasn't like uh, all of a sudden a long illness and, I, okay, this is it. I get relief. No. I went in for a simple kidney stone. I didn't have a long illness. All of a sudden, I'm in the hospital and I'm thinking, I'm dying. And I'll be honest with what I was thinking. I didn't fall off no plane. I didn't fall off no cliff. No car hit me. But I know I'm dying. And where I thought I'd be hysterical, freaked out, and scared. Those were the first things that I thought about. You know, you see that on TV, don't you guys? Ain't that what they do? You know? So she's going, I don't know about that. I don't see that, you know? But the bottom line is where I thought that would be happening to me, all of a sudden, what came up on me were these words I'm going home. Joy, peace, comfort came all over me. Comes with the package. You that are born again. You're not going to have the fear you think you're going to have. You're not going to have the anxiety you think you're going to have. And be honest with you, I don't really know what it is to, like to die. Because I wasn't there when it happened. I left. <laughs> Seriously. Most of us think it's the body that dies and then the spirit leaves. No, it's the spirit that leaves and the body dies. Comes with the package. What package am I talking about? When you became born again, whether you realize it or not, it's been put inside of you. You've got to leave first before that body dies. In James, the second chapter, it says faith without works is dead, just like the body is dead without the spirit. You guys grabbing this? You got to leave first and then your body dies. Most of us don't understand that Jesus Christ died our death. He died it. If you look in Hebrews, the second chapter, it says he died your death. It wasn't just your spiritual death. It was your physical death also. 
He took on all of the things that you would have at that moment, and he died it for you. Somebody better grab what I just said there. That's why Paul wrote later on that there is no longer sting in death. Is that good news, you guys? You know what? You got to understand something. He died your death before you accepted him as Lord and Savior. You don't want to know something about our Lord and how much he loves us? It said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You got to understand what this really means. This is what it means. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, he died for people that never came to know Jesus Christ or never came to God at all. He paid the price of their physical death on that cross. And he paid the price for people that will never, ever come to accept him as Lord and Savior. He died everybody's death that's ever existed on this planet. Physically, he died it, you guys. That's love. That's love, you guys. But because I accepted him as Lord and Savior, because I confessed with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, when it came my time for this to happen to me, I got the benefit of him dying for me. Is that good news, you guys? The other thing that happened right after that, I left my body. I didn't look back. Someone said, well, did you look back and see what was happening? I know I was going home. I didn't need anybody to tell me how to get there. Sometimes people say, well, wasn't there an angel that came and got you? I said, if he did, I left him there. <laughs> My Bible says, you know the way. You know how to get there. You don't need someone guide to tell you how to get there. It's on the inside of you. Over there in the northwest where we used to live, there were salmon that would come up the rivers. They knew how to get to every river that they were spawned in or they were birthed in. When they came out of that ocean, they didn't need nobody to direct them. Okay, you salmons, you go this way. Okay, you salmons, you go that. No, 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 you're going the wrong river. You better watch out. You guys hear what I just said? Us that are born again, it's already planted on the inside of us. We know how to get there. I didn't have no angels sitting by me right there. Elizabeth said, you better watch out. There's a star. Make sure you make a right turn because that left one goes somewhere else. <laughs> you guys getting this? It's already on the inside of you. I can remember leaving this body. I, do it, I did exactly what the scripture said. To be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. How fast is that? Faster than you can blink. Faster than you're hearing my voice right now. Faster than the light that's coming from the ceiling that's touching you. You guys getting this? It was that fast. But I don't say that because I want you to know how fast I got out of here. I don't say that so you know how fast you're going to get out of here. Because I know some of you want to leave really quick. I'm saying that because I want you to understand this. As I'm leaving my body, as I'm leaving the hospital room, as I'm leaving the atmosphere, as I'm leaving what we would call outer space, I entered into this area called outer darkness, or it was real dark. You've heard people say they saw a light at the end of the tunnel. This is the area that they entered into. I saw what I looked like a window at the end of it. Was it a window? No, that's the closest I could come to describing it. You guys getting this? It looked like a window. Was it a window? No, that's the closest I could come to describing it. I was heading straight forward, and all of a sudden, I noticed that was passing me by were these other lights, and they were moving faster than me. And you know what they were? They were the prayers that people were praying for me and others. You got to grab what I just said there. How fast was I moving? To be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. And yet the prayers that people were praying for me and others were passing me by. They looked like shooting stars. Were they shooting stars? No. That's the closest I can come to describing what they looked like. Whether you realize it or not, your prayers have substance to it. See, most of us don't understand this. And I said this yesterday, and I think some of you caught it. But I'm going to say it again. Your mouth was created to talk to one being, and it wasn't your spouse. <laughs> Whoever said that, we need to pray for you. Because <laughs> you got trouble coming when you get home. <laughs> you know? But your mouth was created to talk to God Almighty. Your voice was created so that he could hear you. 
How do I know that? Because Adam was created in Genesis, the first chapter. There was no spouse at the moment. Someone said he could talk to animals, but he wasn't created to talk to animals. He was created to talk to God. Grab what I just said there. Your very lips were put together for you to talk to God. My Bible even tells me, and I love what it says about prayer here. It's found in 1 Peter 3.12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers. That means he wants to hear from you so bad, he's going like this. You guys hear me? Your very mouth was created to talk to him. Is that good news? I know some of you think your very mouth was created so you can eat more. (laughs) And if you say, yeah, but your voice, your mouth has a voice that comes out of it. That voice was created to be heard by one being, and that was God Almighty. Today we song sung, and you're not just singing to be singing. You're singing to a being that can hear you. You're singing to a being that will react to your songs. Is that good news, you guys? Most of us don't realize that. I'm not going to get too much into prayer right now because that's not where God is leading me. But I will say this, and I love to say it. Your prayers that are prayed from the heart do not have a shelf life. I've been listening to your pastor. You know, he can talk a lot. And he got good things to say. Don't get me wrong. Okay, he got good things to say. But he can talk a lot. Okay. And I've been listening to him. And he's been telling me story after story after story of the favor of God in his life. Some of you probably heard the stories. Okay. But the bottom line is this. It's just not the favor of God. Somebody generations ago prayed for him. And God is still acting out on those prayers in his life. And I'm not saying first generation or second generation. It could be 20 generations ago because your prayers do not have a shelf life. Where's that found? In Acts, the 10th chapter, there's this angel that shows up to a man named Cornelius, which was a Roman soldier. And the first words he says to him is this, your prayers and your good deeds are a memorial before God. Somebody better grab what I just said there. Somebody needs to pray more because you need to build a bigger memorial. Some of you grandparents need to understand, even if you leave the planet, God will still operate off your prayers. It is not a waste of time spending with God talking to him. Because you were created to talk to him. Is that good news, you guys? I'm here because generations ago, somebody prayed for me. I was not raised in a Christian family. My parents didn't go to church on a regular basis. The only time they ever, we ever came close to church is on Easter. You know what I'm talking about, some of you in this room. You know how the church fills up on Easter and Mother's Day. Easter and Mother's Day. Those are the two days. Father's Day, we don't get the same respect there. But mamas, you get the same respect. You can get that son or that daughter to come to church for that one day. You understand what I mean? But we would go to church on Easter, and it really wasn't my parents that went to church. They would literally take me and my three brothers to the local Baptist church, open up the door. We would go into the church, and they would go home. That's what they did. That was my church experience. But because somebody prayed for me, God enacted in my life at the age of 17 when I was searching, and I didn't know what I was searching for. I was searching, and God showed up. Is that good news, you guys? Because someone generations ago prayed for you, and God is still acting off those prayers. Is it the favor of God? Yes, but he is acting off the prayers for you. Some of you in this room, I'm emphasizing this because some of you need to pray more for your family. And stop looking at the results and say, God, whether I see it or not, I know you want it done. And he wants it done more than you do. Is that good news? 
And I know some of you in this room right now say, but I want to see them saved. I was there when people were getting born again in heaven. All of heaven celebrates for one person coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know how they celebrate? They literally turn toward the throne of God. They literally shout the name of the person that accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they give God praise. Is that good news, you guys? Because the Bible does say they celebrate. Ain't that correct? You know, it's no small thing when a person comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I leave my body, I enter into heaven. All of heaven is glad I'm there. Everything in heaven is glad I'm there. Everything in heaven is alive. God is the God of life, not death. Do you guys hear me? Some of the things I'm getting ready to say, some of you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. That's okay. That don't get you in. Jesus does. It's about Jesus. He's the one that gets you in. And even some of the things I'm going to say, I'm way short in trying to explain them. So even if you get there, you're going to act like you knew it all the time. Most of us don't realize we got the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of us. He knows it. A lot of times we don't know something is because our flesh says, you know, that can't be. Do you guys hear what I just said? I've heard people say, I got this word from God. But instead of going to the word of God and figuring it out, they go to a commentary and try to figure it out. They try to use a man to prove that God is God. And I'm not against commentaries. I'm just letting you know that you got the word of God in your hands, in that Bible. Go to the word of God. It will show you. 99% of everything that I experienced when I was with the Father and Jesus in heaven, I can find in the word of God. I tell people all the time, it's not, the, that not what I say that proves the word of God. It's the word of God proves what I say. Somebody better grab what I just said there. I filter it through the word of God. I try to give you the word of God because I'm way short. And you that are born again, if I can give you a scripture, literally you can go back and look at that scripture and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you can move you forward. Is that good news, you guys? So here I am. I enter into heaven. All of heaven is glad I'm there. It's not just the Father. It's not just Jesus Christ. It's not just the Holy Spirit. Everything in heaven is glad I am there. When I say everything, I mean everything. There are animals in heaven, and they are glad I'm there. But they're not just like animals here on the planet. They can talk. They can think. They're, they're, they, they are no longer pets. You guys getting this? I know somebody out there, ah, I don't know if I believe that's okay. That don't get you in, Jesus does. But there is scripture in Revelation, the fifth chapter, that tells you a bunch of, uh, of God's creation comes around the throne. And one of those creations that come around the throne are animals. And what do they do? They give him praise. Is that good news, you guys? Animal lovers, they love it. There is a scripture that says in Revelation 8 chapter that literally there's a bird that is flying around and that bird is proclaiming things. It's talking and it ain't a parakeet. You guys hear me? It says it's really an eagle, you know. So the animals in heaven, when I came in, were glad I was there. They welcomed me in. Is that good news? The atmosphere is alive in heaven. Someone said, what do you mean by that? The atmosphere is alive in heaven. It's intelligent. Someone said to me one time, well, what do you breathe? You don't take this body with you. What do you live off of? You live off of Jesus. But in Revelation to 10th chapter, it says this, the seven thunders spoke. What is thunder? It's atmosphere. You guys grabbing it? And I would have to go to every one of your Bibles and change it. You're going to find it in there. It's already in there. It says the seventh thunder spoke. And John, who was writing down things, was told not to write down what the seventh thunder said. And it wasn't something that sounded like thunder that spoke. It said the seventh thunder spoke. You guys hear me? So the atmosphere was glad I was there. It'd be like you walking in this room, and all of a sudden the atmosphere would start popping. Because you showed up. Is that good news, you guys? Now I'm going to go a little bit farther. I have watched the movie, Beauty and the Beast. Okay? I'm just getting that out of the way right now. 
Because these things, if they are in heaven, this like it'll be in heaven, it'd be alive. You guys hear me? Where is that found in the Bible? You know the ninth chapter of Revelation says there were horns on this table. And on that table, those horns started talking. The horns did. It tells you in the 16th chapter, 7th verse, that the table said something. It tells you in the 19th chapter that the very throne that God sits on, a voice came from the throne, and it wasn't God talking. It was the throne saying something. If these benches were in heaven right now, what would they be saying? Some of them would be saying, it's time to praise the Lord. Stand up. Everything in heaven, now you're getting it. Everything in heaven was glad I was there. It wasn't just the Father. It wasn't just Jesus Christ. It wasn't just the Holy Spirit. But everything in heaven is alive. And I know some of you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. That's okay. That don't get you in. Jesus does. And when you get there, you're going to act like you knew it. And if I'm there when you enter in, you're not going to come up to me and say, Dean, you were right. You know what you're going to say? You are way short in really describing this place. It was like this. Jesus Christ went before me and announced I was coming. Told all of heaven that I was on my way. I was coming. And it wasn't when I left my body. It was the day I accepted him as Lord and Savior. He announced I was coming. You that are born again, you've been announced. Is that good news? All of heaven is looking forward to you coming. I don't think you've ever been in a place where everybody is glad you're there. Am I correct? <laughs> That'd be like you walking in this building and the walls start vibrating because they're so excited you're here. The other day I came home and I have a grandson that's two years old and I have a granddaughter that's five years old. And they were at my place where I live. As soon as I opened up that door, they were jumping all over me and was so excited I entered into that room. That's what it's like going into heaven. You guys getting this? And I say this. Since you've been announced, act like it. Act like it. Everything in heaven is looking forward to you coming. They announced you already. They've already announced your name. You're on your way. Act like it. Is that good news, you guys? Now, I'll be honest with you. That was great. It was great to be entered into heaven and to be accepted like that. But I just didn't want to enter into heaven and be accepted. I wanted to see my Lord. I used to say, and I said it yesterday a whole lot, and you heard me, Pastor Mike. I said this. I was with the Father and Jesus. Said it over and over and over. It wasn't that I wasn't in heaven. I wanted to be where the Father and Jesus is. You don't realize this. Even in your own self right now, your draw is not to heaven. It's to the Father and Jesus. That's what's going on in your body right now. You're being drawn to the Father and Jesus. See, when you were created... You weren't just created on the planet, and sometimes us Christians say to praise God, and that's true. But you were really created so that you could be with your father forever. Amen. That's why you were created. You were born on this planet for one reason, and that's to be with your father forever. And I wanted to be where the father and Jesus is. Some people sometimes say, wasn't that heaven? I say, yes, but you don't understand. Heaven's not heaven without the father and Jesus. You take the Father and Jesus out of heaven, you have no heaven. Someone asked me one time, but you don't say a lot about the Holy Spirit. He on the inside of me. You that are born again, guess what? The Holy Spirit resides on the inside of you forever. Yeah, I might as well get used to it. When I got to heaven, he didn't jump out and say, I got to go get somebody else. <laughs> he is with you forever. Forever he's with you. Someone sometimes say, well, I don't feel close to him. It's not about a feeling. It's about what he said. Yesterday, Pastor Mike said this, and I usually said, Jesus said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. 
He's with you whether you feel like it or, or not. You that are born again. I've heard people say, well, I hope he didn't hear that. He on the inside of you. How much closer can he get? Somebody better grab what I just said there. Well, I don't feel it. It's not by your feelings. It's by what he said. He with you. Somebody in the room right now, you may not be feeling close to God, but he's still on the inside of you. I hope he didn't see that. Yes, he did. He saw it. He was right there. But he did say this. If we do mess up, do something that we should not do, all we have to do is confess to him, and he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins. Amen. Then he says, get back to work. Somebody better grab what I just said there. So here it is. I wanted to be where Jesus is. Here's Jesus. He's standing in this field. Around him is a multitude of beings. I say beings because I don't know what another word to say because they're being everything that God has created them to be. They're not lacking anything. He's in the midst of them. And as he's speaking to them, I come upon him. And what do I do when I see him? I do exactly what the Bible said. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. My wife sings. I can only imagine. But I tell people all the time, when you see your Lord, you know what you're going to do? You're going to bow. That is a natural position of us when Jesus enters the room. Amen. Bowing is not something out of, the, uh, out of the ordinary. That's the ordinary position we take when Jesus enters the room. Is that good news? Amen. So here it is. I bow before him. I look at him and I say these words, you did this for me? The only reason I'm there, the only reason I'm there, the only reason I'm there is because of what Jesus had done. My good works didn't get me in. A lot of times we think if we do this, this, and this, that gets us more into heaven or gets us better position in heaven. What gets you in is coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Even my good works, even me speaking to you right now, as many times as I spoke this, she asked me yesterday, don't you get tired of saying the same thing over and over? I said, I never really say the same thing over and over. God puts it a different way. He tells me how to present it. I will not probably present it this way again another place. Who is doing it? Him working through me. Who gets the credit? He does. I didn't even volunteer to come back, Marilyn. Did you hear what I just said? If I was in heaven and Jesus would have asked for volunteers, I'd be looking at everybody else. Everything's right there. There's nothing wrong. It's past peace. You tell me. You guys getting this? And sometimes people say, didn't you love your wife? Didn't you love your children? Yes, I love them more than you can imagine. But I was thinking, you come here. You come here. That's what your loved ones there are thinking. They want you there. Somebody grabbing this? Huh? The Bible even tells us this, that if we do anything, do it as unto the Lord. He gets the credit for it. Don't pat me on the back. He's the one that gets the credit for it. So when I looked at him, I said, you did this for me. My good works didn't get me in. He did. Somebody better grab what I just said here. Because a lot of times, us Christians, we want people to pat us on the back for something that's being done good through us. Michael can tell you as much as he talks. Michael can tell you as much as he talks, okay, that God is working through him. Am I correct? You may think it's a lot of words, but it's really God working through him. You guys getting this? Even how he puts the story together, it's him that puts the story together. He can't take the credit. There's many ministers that are friends of mine, even Tony Kemp. Some of you know Tony Kemp, and we've talked about this. He'll get up and he'll say something, and you know he's heard it for the first time too. Many ministers can tell you that. I've got minister friends that say, I've got to go home and listen to the CD or the DVD or the, or the USB, whatever they got going on, and hear what everybody else just heard. It's him working through us. We've got to stop trying to take the credit for Jesus working through us. And I know people say, but you lit him. But it's still him. He's the one that gets me in no matter how much I let him work through me. He's the one still. It's, you're going to hear this word come out of me if you come up and say, it's Jesus. 
It's Jesus. You know? Someone said, what about your bad works? Didn't he open up a book and start telling you how bad you was on the planet? Because that's what we say. We say he's going to open up a book, and some of us got a lot of pages in that book. That's what we believe. And that when we get there, he's going to open up that book, and he's going to start telling you. You know, remember in 19... I've got to guess your age. In 1968... You remember when you did this and you said that? I wrote it down, and I'm bringing it up. Are you you're accountable for that? Most of us don't realize this. In Hebrews, the 8th chapter, it says that when he forgives you, he forgets it. So how can he have a book and put in that book all your stuff if he's saying, I, when, I, when you ask for forgiveness, he has forgotten it? It's because we don't understand something. On that page... I'm getting excited about this one. On that page where your name should be is his name. He has taken it, you guys. Some of you got to let go of it because he don't got it. You got to watch out even how you tell your testimony because he don't have a memory of it. You guys getting this? I can remember the guy, uh, 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 Bill Wise, me and him did a meeting together in Florida. And he came up and he introduced himself to me. He's the one that wrote 23 Minutes in Hell. Okay? And he introduced himself to me. And the first thing he says, I wish I would have went to heaven. I just smiled. I was not going to say, I wish I would have went to hell. <laughs> I am not destined for hell. That is not where God is saying, I am going. You guys getting this? So I just smiled at him. But I thought about it later on because we were going to try to do some meetings together. And then him and his wife decided they wouldn't do anything for a while. Every time he's telling you about hell, he has to leave it, live it. You guys getting this? Some of you got testimonies that are bad testimonies. And I'm just telling you to pray and ask God, how do you tell people? Because you got to live it. I get to tell you about heaven. <laughs> do you know how I get to live it? Didn't know I could get that excited, did you? <laughs> Most of the time I hold it in because I can get really excited. You know? When he said he has forgiven you, he has forgotten it. And if there's somebody in your life that keeps on bringing it up, they're not getting it from Jesus. He ain't got it. <laughs> somebody better hear what I just said. If there's somebody in your life that keeps on bringing up something you did a long time ago, and you've asked God to forgive you. He has forgiven you and forgot it. They're not getting it from Jesus. He has it no longer. There is another spirit that's called the accuser of the brethren. They're working with the wrong spirit. Somebody got to get free over that. Do you guys hear what I just said there? I don't know. There's a lot of things I can say. I'm going to be back tonight. But I'm feeling this is what God wanted me to deliver this morning so far. Tonight I'll go a little bit farther. I'm feeling like the Lord wants me to emphasize more of the love that I experienced there. I'll talk probably about the family. Those are the things I'm feeling right now. You know? But again, like I said, it's him working through me. He gets the credit. But I feel this morning that God wanted me to emphasize the things that I emphasized as I entered into heaven. I know some of you may say, well, Ding, I wanted you to talk more about the flowers. I wanted you to talk more about the mountains. I wanted you to talk more about Moses or Abraham or, 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 or maybe Elijah or one of those guys. But I'm going to tell you something. None of them get you in. Jesus does. No flower died on the cross for me. You guys getting this? I could tell you all these things. But if you ain't going, what good is it? What good is it? And when you get there, you don't bow down to no mountain. You don't bow down to no tree. You don't bow down to no grass, no river, no atmosphere. You bow down to Jesus. So that's why I want to emphasize Jesus. Well, there may be people in this room that have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There may be people in this room that have accepted him as Lord and Savior, but that's as far as you've gone. Or you went so far and then you decided you wouldn't go any farther with him. There may be people in this room, and I like to emphasize this one, 
that you need to forgive somebody so you can move further in Christ. That stuff does hinder you. Most of us don't realize you get hindered by unforgiveness. And I even believe that God can take away when they are mentioning a person that you have not uh, uh, what you said you've forgiven, but you don't want to hear their name anywhere. You know what I'm talking about? Or when they do talk, talk about their name, you get, uh, it just causes a reaction. I believe God can heal that. The reason I laid out those, those things, because right now I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. I'm going to ask Pastor Michael to come up here with me. If you're in this room and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and something that I've said this morning, something that's touched you, something that's pulled you closer to God, and you're thinking, I need to make that decision. And I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm not saying this to manipulate you. But I'm going to tell you something. You're going to find out sooner or later. When you leave your body, you're going to find out. And if you don't know him, you're not going to be able to go into where I went into. And you may say that's your belief system. And I would say you'll find out. But if you're in this room and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you want to do that with every eye closed and every head bowed, just raise your hand right now. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. We want to see hands. If you never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you want to make that decision this morning, raise your hand right now. Let's say you made that decision before. You accepted him as Lord and Savior, but you haven't gone too far. Or you went so far and then you decided that you ain't going no farther than that. Or you decided, well, I'm going to church, but I'm really going to do what I want to do and not what God wants me to do. You know, that's backsliding, too. A lot of times people think backsliding means falling away from the church. In the Hebrew, really what backsliding is, is a donkey on its behind and literally an owner trying to pull it forward. Some of you in this room right now, whether you realize it or not, God has asked you to do something and you told him, no, I'm not going to do it right now. I, I, I don't think I'm ready for that. And he's trying to pull you forward. That's backsliding, you guys. And today you're saying, I need to stop doing that. I need to stop doing it my way because my way is not working. Raise your hand right now. We want to pray for you. Raise your hand. Just raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. Everybody in the room, and I just ask everybody else, please, to close their eyes and, and bow their heads. Keep your hands up. There's some more of you in this room, and you're saying, ding, I got to get this together. I got to get that together before I move forward. No, raise your hand right now. God will help you get it together. You need help. It hasn't worked so far your way. If you're in this room and that's you, raise your hand right now. Don't worry about anybody else and what they're thinking. It doesn't matter what they're thinking. It matters what Jesus knows. Is that you? Raise your hand right now. Just raise your hand. I just feel like there's more people, Pastor Mike, I'm going to go one over that one more time. Some of you, God wants to do a great thing here in this area. But your criteria for him to do it is your criteria and not his. And you're saying until he gets it the way he gets it together on your criteria, then you'll do it. Whether you realize it or not, he wants you to do something before then. Whether you realize it or not, that's still backsliding because he's trying to pull you forward. If that's you saying my criteria doesn't matter, it's all about you, Jesus. I want to do it your way. And that's you. You want to be totally sold out for him. Raise your hand right now. I really believe hands that are going up. God is looking at that. He's seeing that there's going to be a movement inside of you that you have been praying for. You can put your hands down. Some of you, 
Forgiveness is your issue. You haven't forgave somebody. It isn't that they didn't do you wrong, but you still need to move into that realm of forgiveness because it's just bothering you. It's like you taking the poison because you ain't seeing what's really going on in their lives, but it is really messing you up. And you know you need to forgive. It isn't that you want to forgive, but you know you need to forgive. And that's you in this room, and you want us to pray for you. you got to make the decision, but we can pray for you. Raise your hand right now. We want to pray for you. Raise your hand. We see your hands. God sees your hands, too, you guys. Don't think this is a one-way street that me and Pastor Mike are the only ones seeing these hands raised. We're seeing these hands raised, and God's seeing it, too. You need to forgive somebody. You may say, well, I'm not ready to forgive them. That's just, that's that area that sometimes we get, which is pride. And whether you realize it is pride. But I'm telling you right now, God wants you to forgive them. He says it in the Bible that you need to forgive them. But you don't know what they did. It doesn't matter what I know what they did or not. But God is saying, forgive them any old way. It will free you up. That's what it's all about. If that's you and you're in this room and you haven't raised your hand yet, raise it now. God will see that. Some of you are already feeling some release just by raising your hand. The last area I want to talk about is this. You can put your hands down. If you're in the room and you've asked or you said that you have forgiven somebody, that, but every time someone says their name, it gets to you. It just gets to you, you know. It just bothers you, and you want to be free from that. Raise your hand right now. Raise your hand. Just raise your hand. You want to be free from it. No more does it get to you. If that's you, just raise your hand right now. God sees your hand. Now, I'm going to say something. I'm going to ask everyone to put their hands down. There are some of us that are born again in this room that are Christians that are doing things for God, and we're moving in a way. But you know there's somebody in your life that still you do not like to hear their name. It just bugs you. You kind of push by it. You kind of pray in tongues over it, or you just say, Lord, help me get my it. But God wants it to be released that it never bugs you, that it never gets to you. That all of a sudden, you got to think about it second, that they just said the name and it didn't get to me. Or they just said that person and it, it didn't bother me. You haven't raised your hand. And I'm only doing this. I don't usually go this far, but I feel like God wants to go this far. You haven't raised your hand yet. And you say, I forgave him. But this little niche still is there. God wants to take the little niche away. If you haven't raised your hand before and that's you, raise your hand. Just raise it. It's going to happen, you guys. He's going to take the little niche away. It's not going to bug you anymore. You can put your hands down. We had a number of people raise their hands for recommitments this morning, Pastor Mike.